Um, the aim of the session is to examine why empowering women is so critical in driving economic growth and in strengthening the global economy, and looking particularly at the relevance of this to parliamentarians and women in influence. Um, we're thinking to look at the issues that parliamentarians need to consider when looking at inclusive growth and how that inclusive growth can be gender sensitive and how governments and parliamentarians can work to support women's economic empowerment. Uh, we've got three excellent speakers this morning. Um, the first is uh, Pinky Lalani, OBE. Uh, this morning she's just told me that uh, she's been announced as Elle one of Elle magazine's 100 most inspiring women. Um, <laughs> Uh, and is the chair and founder of the Asian Women of Achievement Awards, Awards and the Women of the Future Awards, among a cluster of other programs. Um, a dynamic businesswoman, it says here, and I'm sure that's absolutely true, is listed in the top 10 most powerful Muslim women in the UK. <laughs> uh, and then, if I can introduce as well, Kasha, she'll have to forgive me now for the pronunciation, does... Stashavska, there we are, <laughs> uh, from ActionAid, uh, policy advisor on women's rights from ActionAid. Um, originally from Poland, uh, Kasia is a women's rights policy advisor for ActionAid and undertakes analysis, research and advocacy to have influence in the UK on policy makers working on women's rights. And, uh, and finally, to my right, um, Letitia Nieri, a member of parliament of Tanzania, um, who you heard from this morning as well, but is a, um, a member of the opposition, that's right? Yes. Um, and has a wealth of experience in, as an advocate for women's issues, having founded magazines, worked as a lecturer, and now as a member of parliament working on, on women's rights. Uh, if I can ask Pinky to start. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for asking me here today. I'm delighted and honoured to be here today. Um, it's great to be living in the UK. Diversity is high on the agenda, and I can tick off all the boxes. I'm a woman, I'm an ethnic minority woman, I'm a Muslim woman, and I'm disabled. And you may wonder in what way I'm disabled. About 15 years ago, I developed a very serious hearing problem, so I only have 20% of my hearing. And I wear two very powerful hearing aids, but in spite of that, sometimes when somebody asks me a question, I give a totally wrong answer, like the time when somebody asked me, how long does it take you to make a curry? And I heard, how long have you been in the country? So I said, 37 years. Um, so they said they weren't going to come to my house for dinner. But I came to England um, 37 years ago when I met my husband in India, and I married him in three weeks. And he had done no due diligence whatsoever because he thought he'd got a good Indian wife who could cook and I had never been inside the kitchen. So it's been a very interesting journey. Um, and I just want to share my story with you because I've set up um, a series of programs that the heart of it is the empowerment of women. Uh, one of the first things I was often asked when I came here was being a good Indian woman, do you walk two steps behind your husband? And I would always say, no, I walk 10 steps behind him so he doesn't know what I'm getting up to. I think I've actually increased that now because it makes life such fun. Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, empowerment of women. It's a word that's used so often. And sometimes we forget what it really means. So for me, what empowerment of women means is to be able to give them confidence, to help them give them self-belief, acknowledge what they do, to help them find their voice, to be themselves, to be authentic, and to maximize their potential. And if we can do that, then we can actually add so much to the economy. Um, when I decided 15 years ago, I set up these programs. 15 years ago, people thought all the Indian women they knew sat at home and fried onion pudgers. And that really, really wasn't true because I was coming across some amazing women, so I decided to set up the Asian Women of Achievement Award, which was to find... Oh, is that my it's, time up? No, 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 it's a division bell, so uh, it will stop at a moment. It's just a... <laughs> Okay, that's quite nice. Yeah. Um, th so I set up the Asian Women of Achievements Awards and because I wanted to recognize Asian women. 
is that okay? And um, you know, it, it went looking for them, and we discovered that they were l amazing people. Among the Asian women, we discovered heart lung transplant surgeons, a fertility expert, an opera singer, um, a salsa dancer, all kinds of amazing, amazing women. And the model really was to get people to recognize these women by giving them a platform, other people hear about them and they become role models for the next generation. So that was 15 years ago. And we have some amazing people. This year was our 15th anniversary, so we had people like Liz Hurley was there, Sherry Blair, Justine Miliband, the Deputy Prime Minister's wife, Princess Badia from Jordan. So I think all these people recognizing achievements gives it credibility. I thought that's not enough, so I set up the Women of the Future Awards, which is an award for all women, but they have to be under 35. Um, and again, we discovered amazing people like an 18-year-old who discovered two comets in her gap year, and one of them has been named after her, and she actually discovered an asteroid as well. So amazing people that are really making a difference. And that's not enough just to recognize them and put them on the stage, but really to connect them with others. We talk a lot about networking, and I think I'm always reluctant when people say people are good networkers. I think you have to really build good relationships. So we have a network for women which we've built up, and tonight, in fact, in the evening, we have 200 young women coming to meet other women. And we all know that it helps so much if you actually meet someone and you can carry on your business together. We have the network. And then we have a school program where we have role models being able to meet other people, all the school girls that are coming. And finally, this year, was a dream of mine to have a mini Davos for emerging women leaders. And we worked in collaboration with the Foreign Office, and last month we had people from 25 different countries who actually came, and we had a three-day program. And I think bringing all these people together really, really makes a difference. I think women need that little bit of extra help, because a lot of them, when, when there is a job that is advertised, if a woman has... 80% of the qualities needed, she won't apply because she'll say, I don't have the 20 that they need. And a man, if he, even if he has apparently 60%, will apply and say he can do it. So I think we need, women really need that kind of help. And one of the things that I like to think is that we can do it by, actually there are no barriers, there's nothing that stops us. When I first came to England, I didn't know how to cook. But obviously, I've learned to cook. I've written two cookery books. I actually run leadership seminars based around cookery. And I take my walk everywhere. I'm sorry I haven't brought it here today, but normally when I speak, I end by cooking spicy Bombay potatoes and sharing it with the audience because that's the culture I come from. So I'd like to invite all of you, if you are ever in the UK again, if you want to come and have some potatoes at my home, I would welcome you there. So normally, I take my potatoes and tomorrow I'm speaking at the Judge Business School at Cambridge and to 190 MBA students and I'm taking my walk along. So the whole thing about empowering women is about making them believe that they can actually do anything and governments can play a huge part in this. And the reason they can is that I think we need to help parents to give access to their children to see, uh, see there are so many professions. Women don't think of going in somewhere where they've never seen anybody else in their family. I work very closely with the Bangladeshi community. And so many of those girls say, you know, we'd love to be a lawyer, but we've never met a lawyer. I'd love to work in the foreign office, but I've never been in there. And I think the government can work much more in helping uh, with uh, giving internships to students so that they can actually think they can do everything. I think also what's very, very important is that some of the facts that have emerged here, that in 2011, only 29% of women felt they had the skill to start a business compared to men. There were 45% of men who said that they could actually start a business. So I think, you know, we all need to work together because I think if the woman flourishes, everybody flourishes. And I know that for me it's really nice because all the stories, the anecdotal evidence of asking for women, there's a very nice, I, my mantra is you have not lived a perfect day unless you've done something for someone who can never repay you. So for me it's how can I do the kindnesses for women? So I asked the question for them. So I've asked, you know, when we had these 50 women, Asian women, I asked um, the master of the household in Buckingham Palace, can I bring them 
for a visit to the palace. And they say the only thing you get for in life without asking is an infectious disease. You have to ask for everything else. So, you know, it's asking and giving women uh, you know, the experiences that can make them reach higher. Um, I'm going to end now because my own research and research in America where they do all kinds of research shows that after about 12 minutes, 20% of the audience start thinking of what they're going to do as soon as the talk is over. 20% are reminiscing, 12% are thinking of religion, and 17% are having erotic thoughts. I'm not going to go any further. I rest my case there. Thank you. Thank you very much. A tough act to follow. Um, Kasia, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, in the kind of old traditional habit, I decided to go to, for PowerPoint, uh, which might be a little bit difficult after such an inspiring talk, but I hope you will bear with me. Uh, so it's a real pleasure and honor to be here today with you and um, actually together reflect on the progress on the, the critical area of women's economic empowerment. Um, my name is Kasia Staszewska and I work with ActionAid. ActionAid is an international development organization. We work in over 40 countries and try to fight poverty by putting human rights and women's rights at the center of our work. And um, I am really delighted to also have a chance to talk with you today about the area of women's economic empowerment because of the timing. I mean, namely, we are in the end of 2014 and just in front of us is the crucial year of 2015. And we all know that in 2015, um, our leaders, international community, is going to negotiate and eventually agree uh, the new set of sustainable development goals that is going to guide our development efforts for at least the next 15 years. Also, 2015 is the uh, 20th anniversary of the landmark agreement, uh, so-called Beijing Platform for Action, agreed in 1995 to fast forward and to put into reality the landmark UN Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So far, the most ambitious and comprehensive agreement made by international community on the whole set of women's rights. So um, it only really seems to be right to stop for a moment and reflect where have we actually gone up to today, 15 years after MDGs and 20 years after Beijing. And there is a good news and there is a bad news. Um, the good news is that um, basically the whole set of world leaders, whether we're talking here about UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon or Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of International Monetary Fund, or uh, you know, the politicians from our countries, including our own Secretary of State, Justin Greening, as well as feminist activists, civil society, women's rights organizations, so a whole set of these actors all agree that women's economic empowerment is critical, it's a right thing to do, and it's a smart thing to do because it drives and contributes to economic development, economic growth, sustainable development. So here, everything's fine. Um, yet despite this call for action that you can actually see by the, by the world leaders behind me, actually what data and evidence tell us is unfortunately much less encouraging. So basically what we're seeing is that 15 years after MDGs and 20 years after Beijing, men are still nearly twice as likely as women to have full-time good jobs, and in South Asia they are three times as likely. Um, on average, women earn 10 to 30% less than men for the same comparable work. And if we are to keep with the current pace at closing, with closing the gender pay gap, it would take us 75 years to actually make the principle of the equal, equal pay for equal work a reality. Also, the, the recent uh, research report by the World of Bank Group has uh, discovered that out of over 140 countries, in 128, there is still at least one legal differentiation in the area of women and the economy. And in the 15 countries, women still require the, the permission from their husband to take up the paid work. And finally, over the last decade, the women's participation in the labor market has actually stagnated and even decreased from the 57 to 55%. And as we learned very recently from the, from the report by the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, is that the, the gap between men and women in terms of economic opportunities and participation over the last decade closed only by 4%. So this progress, 
I hope you can agree, as, as this is the hard, hard court, hard line data, it's not actually the one to be celebrating. So, so again, we, we can kind of stop and reflect. Why is it the case? Hence, we do actually have an agreement that women's economic empowerment is so important. And unfortunately, what research tells us, and also what we learn as Action Aid in the job, is that response is really not that straightforward. It's, it would be really difficult to point out one signal factor, why is it that we're actually not progressing as fast as we would like to progress. And there's a number of issues. The first one being still discriminatory <coughs> social norms serving as a, as a key deprivation factor that still keeps women out of school, make women more responsible for the unpaid care work, and the most pervasive thing really being the violence against women and girls. It is obviously closed with the issue of women's agency, so something that Mrs. Realiani has just been talking to us about. So the women really exercising control over their everyday lives, the freedom of movement, the, the, as the control over assets and resources in the household, as well as their sexual reproductive health and rights. And these discriminatory social norms is, are also, to a certain extent, linked with the government policies and really the government's actions or inactions to ensure the endowments and opportunities for women. And hence, we're talking also about about women's economic empowerment, it's also important to mention the, the issue of the private sector and the corporation that agreed might be a force for good, driving the women's economic empowerment. But unfortunately, we, we also learn about, a lot about the abusive behaviors by the corporations that are taking advantage of women's rights. So all these, all these factors really combine together, as well as the others that uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss all of them here, are kind of coming together and translating to the fact of the women's inequality in the world of work. And um, really taking advantage of the opportunity and honor to be talking to you today, I would especially like to draw your attention to the key two key crucial issues that we believe that require urgent attention and action uh, today and in view to 2015 uh, agreements and negotiations. And this is uh, the, the feminization of the precarious and, and informal work, as well as the, the area of um, invisibility and women's disproportionate responsibility for unpaid care work. So starting from the feminization of, of the precarious work, um, if I may, I mean, in general, in the women's econ economic empowerment theory, I mean, how the things should happen is that women access paid work and she's rewarded for her skills and um, she has an opportunity if she wants to start the entrepreneurship uh, business to access credits and this should translate into her access, successful access to the labor market and she should be economically empowered. But unfortunately, the reality is, is much more complicated than that. So women really accessing the labor market, but unfortunately ending up in the, in the precarious and vulnerable employment. And uh, what, for example, data from the International Labor Organization tells us that in, in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, over 80% of jobs um, available for women are in precarious and, in, and vulnerable employment. So it's a huge number, and when I say precarious and vulnerable employment, I mean the jobs that are poorly paid, that they don't have a chance to enjoy the, the, the basic labor rights, such as maternity leave, sick leave, um, obviously collective bargaining, leave the loan social protection. And this is also what we learn in the job as Action Aid. I mean, our research into one year after the tragedy of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, as well as the, the supply chains of British supermarkets in, in Bangladesh, Costa Rica, um, India, shows the poor wages, the denial of, of basic rights, and uh, the insecurity of the women workers at the jobs that originally were supposed to be empowering. Um, the second issue um, that I would like to talk to you briefly about is the issue of women's unpaid care work, which, which I'm delighted to say that finally, after, after decades, is getting more and more traction in the mainstream uh, development debates, also within the context of the discussions around the new sustainable development goals. So when I say women's unpaid care work, I do refer to the classic kind of household duties, so child rearing, 
cooking, cleaning, but this work this workload increased much and much more within the context of um, poorer economies. So because there is a water to be fetched or firewood to be collected, and what actually data tells us, and it's not only data from the civil society, but more and more the data from the World Bank or the human system, that is that um, the women's un disproportionate responsibility for unpaid care work is really the one of the most important factors that keep women out of the labor market. It is also within the context of uh, the realities when public services are unavailable as women tend to and actually take up the, the work of public services, whether it means caring for the sick, as we have seen in the, within the context of AIDS crisis in South, South Africa or even Ebola today in West Africa, uh, but also when the services to care for the elderly and children are not available. When women tend to finish up staying in the household, not going to work. This also has a very serious implication of the whole other spectrum of their rights. So the right to pursue education, and as such has a link with their access really and entry into the precarious work because they are not having a chance and opportunity to acquire the skills to get better jobs. So what data tells us is really that um, women in all countries of the, in the world really usually perform two times or more t or, or even more um, unpaid care work than men. Obviously in some countries the situation is more is more harsh than others, and I find it really um, kind of compelling that the recent census, for example, in India, has revealed that 45% of women uh, are solely confined to domestic duties. They don't take up any other work. Uh, um, similarly, in Latin America and Caribbean, the research has shown that um, even um, half of women in the age of 20, 24, uh, do not seek work outside the home because they are performing the unpaid care work. And finally, the, the estimations around the, if, if we were to translate the unpaid care work into the GDP, actually the estimation shows that it would actually constitute between 10 and 50% of the gross domestic product. And not further than, than yesterday, I, show, I saw the data from the time use service in Morocco that showed that if we were to compile the women paid work and unpaid work, it would translate to 35% of the GDP of the country. So that these are huge numbers. So coming back to, to the original question, I mean, um, how women's economic empowerment, women's economic equality translate to development and growth. I mean, we have tons of evidence and the answer is straightforward, yes. It really does translate because it, it, it translates and contributes to improved living standard, it boosts productivity, enhances social cohesion, it strengthens growth. But obviously, as Action Aid, being a civil society and women's rights advocate, we also want to ask the question the other way. I mean, is it that economic growth really and economic development translate to um, progress on the front of gender equality and women's rights? And unfortunately, the, the answer here is much more complicated. And as we don't have evidence that, that prove this, this kind of linear relationship, and, and what is more, as, as I've been trying to show you, there are actually cases when the growth happens at the expense of women's work. So um, unfortunately, the, it, it is not like um, it is within the context of women's economic equality contributing to growth. So what does it really tell us about the, the way forward? I mean, I think it tells us a lot. Uh, what can be done and what should be done. And, and the, uh, obviously, as I was trying to show, this women's economic equality is not it's not a straightforward thing. It's a multidimensional thing that requires multifaceted approaches. But definitely the first thing is that we need to complement the business case for, ca for change with the human rights-based approach. So it's not only that the women's economic equality will happen by investment in the economic reforms. It will need, really need, really, re we really need to invest and prioritize the delivery on the human rights front. So the obligations that actually already exist, such as CEDO, so the mention Convention on, on, on Elimination of Forms of Discrimination Against Women, as well as Beijing Platform for Action that we are going to celebrate 20th birthday. It is also very closely relate, related with promoting the policies of women's leadership, as Mrs. Liliani said, and, um, and ending violence against women and girls, their sexual reproductive health and rights. 
Finally, we also need to, we need to make sure that the ambition for the next set of development goals is set very high, uh, definitely higher than its predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals. And at the moment, the, the proposals, I think, I dare to say, are quite ambitious because in the proposal we have a target on reducing unpaid care work, we have a target on equal wage for equal work, the target on decent work for women, and this really need to stay. And except that, we also really need to ensure that the governments invest more in women's economic empowerment and delivery of services, also to redistribute their unpaid care work so that can more success successfully enter the labor market. I mean, Madam Chair is already looking at me, so I'm just going to finish here now saying that um, as Action Aid, we really believe in the parliamentarian's role in championing this cause. I mean, there's a lot that can be done, starting from really serving as advocates for this critical area of women's economic equality pushing governments to, to be more ambitious and to make more ambitious commitment to address the letter and finally holding them accountable for, for the commitments they already made. So, um, and as ActionAid, we would be very happy to work together with you and support you in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Kasia, very much. Um, Letitia. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Leticia Nyerere, member of the parliament from Tanzania. Um, I have to admit that uh, I appreciate to be given this opportunity to speak about women empowering and economic development. Women's empowerment can only happen when women are free to move independently and share information. There is no way a woman can be empowered if she's closed in one place and not allowed to move around. They will be empowered when they have a, a safe place together to share their views, but some men do not allow their wives to mingle with fellow women. I wonder if you guys, you know, do allow your wives to, to move around, but some don't, so. Women require free movement without escort from their husbands so that they will be free. They can meet fellow women, mingle with fellow women freely, have conversations freely without being monitored by a husband on the side. So that's what women need to have to begin with. They have to be free to move around. <coughs> Some women, they have to ask permission even to go to a hairdressing salon, which is wrong. I do not recommend that. Women have to be independent thinker, they have to take care of issues that pertain themselves and not to depend on men 100%. Women have to be educated and be literate, ideally from village level, so they, they know what they are capable of and their expectations. If, for example, I'm married to a husband who comes from a tribe who believe that if a husband does not beat you up, it means he doesn't love you. <laughs> Fortunately, this isn't the case in my marriage because I wouldn't accept it. Another way of empowering women is to give them financial access. So giving a woman financial access is empowering the woman because she will be able to be self-employed, she will be able to get into uh, small businesses and so forth. So it's very important. And if, <coughs> if this is coupled with the training skills, it is even more 
effective as many women are excited about learning new things. <clears throat> I went to my constituents, I taught women how to make Vaseline, just the regular Vaseline. They were all excited and they, they are very happy with that. It was a new thing and it excites them. They continue making Vaseline, they sell and use. So it's very important. I mean, women are always excited to learn new things. So skills is, a, is crucial. So um, a woman is empowered when her confidence is increased. So if you want to empower a woman, you must increase her confidence. This can be, uh, it can be hard to achieve because of some cultural beliefs in our countries. And uh, so, for example, in Tanzania, some tribes believe women cannot speak up before a man. And strangely, some women support this. So these are the barriers that uh, they, they hinder women, women's empowerment. Yeah, and it's sometimes, uh, uh, if you try to cross these barriers as a leader or as an MP, you, you may lose your popularity because uh, most women believe in those cultures. So it's a battle between the reality and the cultures. And as a, as a legislator, you have to come up with a way to, to tackle that. So um, also, I'd like to talk about good health for women. You cannot empower a woman if she's not in good health. So this is very important aspect. So um, if a woman is in good health, she will be able to move around. She will be able to do what she does in the household. She will be able to learn whatever that she wants to learn. And she will be able to network. Networking is crucial because without ne networking, there is no way a woman can change from one stage to another. So that's why we encourage women, even in villages, that they network so that they'll be able to learn from one another. So we need to empower them by putting them in groups whereby they can network. There is this um, decision-making uh, aspect. We cannot empower women if we don't have enough women leaders in decision-making positions. So we need to have as many posi decision-making positions in, in women as possible so that we will be able to help the fellow women in the villages and you know, we will be able to, to teach them to do things, to do the right things. But otherwise, if we have the minority women leaders, this may not happen. So therefore, we are crying for more positions for women, more decision-making positions for women. And I'm glad uh, with our new constitution in Tanzania, this is going to happen because we are expecting 50% equal positions in the parliament and other positions in leadership. So as a parliamentarian, when you're promoting inclusive growth, that is gender sensitive, I will first of all invest in education for rural women. But the majority are not even aware that they, they need education. They think that their lives are fine without it. So it is my obligation to create awareness of the challenges and attempt a solution. But again, this can also be affected by cultural beliefs. So ladies and gentlemen, um, 
I will finally like, like to emphasize that the issue of women empowerment has to be linked and shared globally. It's not a single country issue. This is a global issue. So we have to tackle it globally. We have to share the information and make sure that this issue of women's empowerment has to be linked and shared globally. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'll be more than happy if, to answer questions, if, if any. Thank you very much.